loods. We just wait a few seconds till everything uploads. Okay. Good morning, Kahal Kadosh, Shavuot Tov, Mevorach, Mirochim, Abayim, to everybody. Today, Tuesday, the 14th day of Sivan, corresponding to May 25th, 2021. Today's class, graciously sponsored by the Warman and Lufasi families, the Ailu Nishmat, Leon Ben Rahel, Meir Ben Sarina, Yosef Ben Rahel, Alema Shalom, and for the Refua Shalema of Shemuel Aharon Ben Sarina, among the Holy of all of Am Israel. Amen. Before we begin with the class, today is the your site of two great hachamim, two great tzaddikim. One of them was known as Rabbeinu Chaim of Bolojin. He was a student of the Gaon. to the greatest hachamim of that generation. And after the war of Yom Kippur, 1973, he decided to dedicate his life to help Am Israel to do Teshuvah. I remember as a child, listening to his lectures in cassettes. Remember those, you know, the two things with two holes in the middle? For the younger generation, maybe they don't know what I'm talking about, but <laughs> cassettes, the cassettes used to play, and it will give these fiery words of Torah that will shake the soul of the person, that will shake the wall of the, uh, the Neshama. And Baruch Hashem is responsible for thousands, or for thousands of people to do in Teshuvah. And Be'ezat Hashem, Iratzon, the Zahut of these two Sadiqim, obviously gives us the Hizuk in these very days. Uh, right after the celebration of uh, Shavuot. Going back to the Bihaim uh, Nivolojin, there is a concept that I read, uh, and it's a known fact attributed to him, and this is one of the prayers that I say on a regular basis, which is the prayers about suffering. That there is a prayer about suffering. And basically, what the prayer says, that a person understands that the suffering of the person and whatever comes across the person's life is earmarked from Akadosh Baruch Hu. That's why he says a very known segula, and it says that if a person finds themselves in challenging situations, in difficult moments, he should remember the three magic words, en od mi There is nothing but Akadosh Baruch Hu. And he writes in the Nefesh Haim that when it comes specifically to the prayer of Alenu le Shabbeah, he says at the end of the end first paragraph, Biadata Yom Mashevota Lebabecha, Kiyashem wa Eloki, Mashamai Mimal, Bealaris Mitahat en all, a person should be mechaven on this particular concept. That everything that comes across the life of the person, that a person experiences through life, is directly from Akadosh Baruch Hu. And one, once a person comes not to know this, but actually to internalize this concept that Akadosh Baruch Hu is the one who runs the world and our life, it gives the person a certain a positive outlook in life. Additionally, he says, also in the same book, Nefesh Ahayim, that a person who wants to 
create that the power of prayers should be uh, effective in the person's life, when especially when it comes to the Amidah, he says, and I, I hope that he understood this correctly, he says, don't just read. Just put your finger under each word. Ata, honen, leadam, da'ad. Now, that's one way to understand. Another way to understand, that's much deeper, it says, trace the letters. If it's Aleph, that will take a very long time. So let's concentrate on placing the finger underneath each word. And sometimes you see people who do this. That when they pray the Amidah, they don't just look, they, they point their finger, like in the Kitab, in the Talmud Torah, letter, kamats, alif, a. So you do the same thing. Don't do that. But basically, ata, honen, again, ata, honen, and da. And my lips are moving faster than my finger. So it says each word, ata, honen, le adam, da'at. Hashivenu, avinu, le toratecha. These are some of the things written by the great Rabbeinu Chaim Mivolojin, the student of the Gaon of Vilna. Zechutam yagen aleinu. Amen. Baruch atah Adonai Eloheinu Melech HaOlam Sheakol Nihiyah Bid Baruch. Amen. Okay. Uh, interesting enough, the Zohar of today is actually a continuation from last week's Torah portion. In last week's Torah portion, the longest perasha of the Sefer. How did we finish the perasha? Discussing all about the Nesi'im, which is familiar to our reading, because this is also the reading of Hanukkah. Every day of Hanukkah, we read from the Nesi'im like we read last Shabbat. But in the last day of Hanukkah, known in Jewish law as Zot Hanukkah Tamizbeach, the reading of Hanukkah does not finish with the end of the Perashah Naso, but automatically we jump into Perashah Beha'alotecha. And we go through Perashah Beha'alotecha, the first few Pesukim, when the Torah describes the building of the Menorah, Bayaz Ken Aharon El Mul Pene Menorah, Bezema Asia Menorah, Kamar E Asher Ha Hashem et Moshe, Ken Asa et HaMenorah. We already gave a shi'ur on the menorah proper, so we didn't have to go through all the details, but we know who was in charge of lighting the menorah every day? Aharon Kohen. So comes the Zohar Kadosh, and it says as follows. The actions of Aharon Kohen lighting the menorah, this was a sacrifice, so to speak, not an animal type of offering, the way we usually relate to Korbanot, to Korbanot, but this was basically the offering of Aharon. It's like I ask you, what can you offer to the synagogue? For example, right? So you tell me, Rabbi, anyone who needs an apartment next to the shul, let them talk to me. I just give you a free advertisement, more valuable than Super Bowl 30 second commercial, right? Because yeah. that's one day only. TryTorah.com, well, we're gonna keep your identity secret. Anybody interested, talk to me, I'll give you his name and number. Thank you. Now, Thank you. Of, you like it? Beautiful, Hazak. Anyways, you. continues and it says that offering is not always connected to a sacrifice. You know, what do you bring on the table, for example? That's the idea. So the Zora Kadosh explains that this was not only representing Aharon Kohen and the Kohanim, but also this was a tribute to the tribe of Levi. Because at the end of the day, Kohen and Levi have shared more or less, I don't want to say the same DNA, because I'm sure somebody's going to tell me, Rabbi, there is a DNA for Kohanim and there is a DNA for Leviim. But I'm not talking about the physical blood type DNA. But I'm talking about the spiritual DNA. So it says in Zohar Kadosh, 
and it says as follows, that this concept of lighting the menorah, it wasn't just a mere lighting of the candles. For example, today, uh, and we have a lot of Argentinians in the audience, physical and virtual. Today is May 25th. May 25th in Argentina is a very, right? It's a very patriotic date. Literally, it's a very patriotic day. Like American has Memorial Day and Independence Day. So what do we did in, in, in Argentina back in the day, which I see some classmates here with me, what did we used to do? Line up at 8 o'clock or 8 or 5, and the first step of the day was the Pledge of Allegiance. We will sing the national anthem. That was the protocol. That was the protocol. Line up the song of the nation. And you must wear the a ribbon or a, a different type of, a, you know, I th- how do you call it, a ribbon? Yeah. A ribbon, okay? With the flags, with the color of the flags. This was, Yanni, to do, to show our uh, national pride and thankfulness to the government and to the nation that welcomed the Jewish people back uh, in the day. I'm not sure if this concept still applies today, but as a child, I remember that this was our daily protocol. So the Zohar Kadosh writes and it says, why is there a need for the Torah to repeat again the concept, not the incident, but the story or the, or the, or the dynamics of the menorah? This was already discussed back in Sefer Shemot. Right? Terumah, Tetzaveh, Kitisah, Bayaghel, Pekudeh, Perashiot that deal with the building of the Mishkan. Why is there a need to repeat again in Perashah Be'alotecha the concept of the menorah? So the Zohar Kadosh writes and it says the following. There are two aspects to this concept. Number one, the feelings of Aharon a Kohen. Imagine yourself, the inauguration of the Mishkan takes place. Let's remember rapidly, or let's remind ourselves rapidly, what was the source of the Mishkan? We received the Torah, 40 days later, the scene of the golden calf. Moshe breaks the Luchot, 40 days break. Moshe goes up, Rosh Chodesh Elul, comes back Yom Kippur, gives us the second set of Luchot, based on those 40 days, Sephardic people have Selichot to atone for our actions of the year. Now, Moshe gives the commandment of the building of the Mishkan. In a record time, we collected all the necessary funding and goods for the Mishkan. After a Sukkot, we began the building of the Mishkan. The Mishkan finished on the 25th day of Kislev, which later on will be known as the holiday of Hanukkah. And the Mishkan was inaugurated Rosh Chodesh Nisan. That was the very same day that the sons of Aharon, Nadav and Avihu, regretfully passed away. That is the very same day that the first offering of Nachshon ben Aminadav takes place and consequently, every tribe offers a korban. And now we have Aharon Kohen, the brother of Moshe and Miriam, watching from the sidelines. And he sees that his name is not being called. What do you think, Rashi says, goes through the mind of Aharon Kohen? Moshe Aharon says, because of my intervention and involvement in the scene of the golden calf, so God is penalizing me. And therefore, I don't have the merit of offering the sacrifices in the first 12 days of the inauguration of the Mishkan. This is what's going through the mind <coughs> excuse me, of Aharon Kohen. 
God obviously knows this and tells Aharon, don't worry. Your zehut is greater than their zehut. Their day of shining or the day that the spotlight was on top of them was one day. The day that that particular tribe offered the korban. But your day will be every day of the lighting of the menorah. So historically speaking, even though we were given the commandment of the one of the main components of the Mishkan being the menorah, but then the menorah was not lit. The menorah was built. But when did the actual lighting of the menorah, so to speak, took place based on the, on the dynamics of the Pesukim? In this week's Torah portion. So I remember reading a while back that, and I do not remember the source quoted, but I do know that I saw it in the Sefer of Hacham Mordechai Eliyahu Ala Shalom, Divrei Mordechai. And there he says that a Haron Kohen says to Akadosh Baruch Hu, God, thank you for giving me the zehut of lighting the menorah. But it says, but what's going to be after the Mishkan is gone? It says you're going to have the Beta Mikdash. And what's going to be after the Mikdash? What's going to be? It says, don't worry. You're going to have the Mizvah of Hanukkah. Hanukkah. Other opinion says that God says to Aharon, do not worry. After the destruction of the Beta Mikdash, we're going to have two misvot connecting to the menorah. Shabbat candles and Hanukkah. I always knew, and I'm sure everybody agrees, that Hanukkah and the lighting of the menorah in the Beta Mikdash are very similar concepts. The Hidush that he writes is that this includes also the candle lighting of Erev Shabbat, which is a Takanat Hachamim, that the wife lights the candle, Lichbot Shabbat Kodesh. And in part, makes sense. What is the idea of the menorah? To bring light. What is the idea of Shabbat candle lighting? To bring light. So you don't have to wait once a year till Hanukkah happens to be. And then you remember, oh yeah, miracle of Hanukkah that happened over 2,200 years ago. So every Friday afternoon, when the wife, or in the case that the wife is not there, the husband lights the candle, to a certain extent, is like a Harona Kohen lights the candles in the Bet HaMikdash. And that's why when the, the candle lighting time arrives, a person should light the candles on time, but everyone agrees that what is Hachamim tell us clearly that the candle lighting time is an etratzon. Etratzon means it's a moment of goodwill, that the gates of heaven are widely open. And that's why the Benish High writes that a husband should train to put sedaka next to the kupa, next to the candles, so the wife puts sedaka before candle lighting, and everybody knows that there is a special prayer that the wife usually recites found in the Aneni book. Or if you go to Israel or New York and you ask, you, you get a beautiful poster, right? Or a, or a frame that says the Berachov candle lighting. What else do you have? You have a special that's on. That the wife prays for the husband, prays for the children, prays for Am Israel. That's where the famous song Bezakeini you heard of this song from your grandkids I'm sure you did I'm sure you did and they know it so tell me sing me with Zakeini today with the popularity of Jewish music you gotta ask which version it happened to me the other day I started to sing this song one of my grandkids says no 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 that's not that's the old version from Baruch Levine. Now we need to upgrade to Benny Friedman. 
or to or to or to simcha liner. Vezakeni legadei. You see, I'm giving you three versions. Vezakeni, vezakeni. This is the third version by I think Baruch Levin, wonderful composer of Jewish music. And what does it say that song? God, give me the merit, give me the honor, give me the privilege, the privilege to raise my children and grandchildren in the beautiful ways of the Torah, to serve Hashem properly. Now, why specifically this level of prayer is inserted right after the blessing of the candlelight? Because this is like the moment that Aharon and Kohen will light the menorah in the Bet HaMikdash. It doesn't get better than that. That's why it's called Et Ratzon. What's the meaning of Et Ratzon? A moment of goodwill. A moment that there is a transition in the heavens from the mundane of the weekday into the Kedusha of the Shabbat Kodesh. Powerful. Powerful, powerful. And I add one more thing that is also brought down by the Hachan. That what was the main reason that our Hachamim established candle lighting at our homes in honor of Shabbat? Why? What? What's the main reason? Shalom Bay, Hazaku Baruch. The main reason why candle lighting was established was for Shalom Bayit. What was the middah of Aharon Kohen? Ohev Shalom, Berodev Shalom. Now you have another bonus round of how everything matches and everything fits into the, 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 the proper uh, uh, equation, so to speak. Powerful. Somebody asked the other day, Rabbi, why we have so many supervisions of kashrut in the world? Good question. Couldn't be one uniform, unified? So the short answer is no. Different customs, different traditions, different sources, different standards. But interesting enough, the Zora Kadosh writes, that the menorah by itself, and I discussed this in the past, is actually the, cord, the combination of the entire week. Correct? Three poles on the right, three poles on the left. The center pole is the day of Shabbat. So if you have to read the menorah, you should read it. Wednesday, Thursday, Friday, Shabbat, Sunday, Monday, Tuesday. That's how it works. That's how it works. Take, take, take it from me. That's how it works. Why? The Lacha writes that someone who didn't do Havdalah on Musa'i Shabbat, you can do it till when? Tuesday night. Till Tuesday night. Why till Tuesday night? Because till Tuesday night, we still are drawing the Beracha of last Shabbat. Wednesday is a switch in the week, Kabbalistically speaking, and now we're absorbing the sanctity of the upcoming Shabbat. And if you look in the Siddur of the Benish Hai, that it brings down this concept. In many Siddurim, it says, for example, today, Hayom Yom Shelishi Be Shabbat Kodesh. Today is Tuesday of Shabbat. <clears throat> now, why do I need to say Shabbat on Tuesday? I'll make the question even bigger. Sunday morning, you're still digesting the cholent or the melave malka. And you say, Hayom yom ehad be Shabbat Kodesh. Stand the here. Relax. You just finished Shabbat. You still have to do the dishes. Clean up the house. And you're already saying, oh, Shabbat is coming. This reminds me of Shammai in the Talmud. The Talmud tells us that Shammai will go to the supermarket Sunday morning to see what he finds special in honor of Shabbat. 
and this was before the time of having freezers and, and, and Zob Zeros and Bosch and Electrolux dual doors, double doors. This is how wash am I. But guess what? The next morning, Tuesday, Monday, he will go again. Maybe something new came. And every day he will go to do something like what Shabbat Kodesh. So Shabbat and the person really cannot be separated. Shabbat is with us constantly. Not only that, in one of the classes that we gave back at the end of Sefer Shemot, I think that we call it a verse from the Zohar that says that all the blessing of the week emanates from the Shabbat. And that's why a person needs to be always Mosif, Tosefet Shabbat. Tosefet Shabbat means expand a bit the Shabbat. Receive it a few moments before and don't rush to run away from it. Extend it a bit. Just a few moments, could be just a few minutes. And that brings great toilet to the life of the person. So the Zohar Kadosh writes and it says that also Bene Israel had 12 Shevatim. And the way they were lined up, the Shevatim were three in the front, three in the back, three on the left, three on the right. And they had the strategic positions and each one has a different flag and every one has a different symbol and every one has a different color. And, and yet, they are all united for one goal, to connect with Hashem. Like the Hafez Haim was asked the same question, but with much more details. And the Hafez Haim lived almost 100 years ago, he will take. And he was asked, why you have to have so many partitions in Am Israel? You have Sephardic, you have Ashkenazic. Now, Ashkenazic what? Sephard or Ashkenaz? Hasidic, Yeshivish. Hasidic, which group? Okay? Now you have Sephardic. Sephardic, what type? Sephardic from Morocco? From which part of Morocco? Tetuan, Casablanca, Marrakesh, Fez, oh, from Syria. From what Syria? Baxita or Jalemiye? <laughs> Halab or Sham? Understand? Yeah. Oh, from Yemen. From Baladi or what? <laughs> Persian. Are they Sephardic or they are Persian? So to speak. I hope no one takes offense. Okay? So now, the Hafez Haim, when he heard this question, he says as follows. The Jewish people are called the army of Hashem in the world. In a spiritual way. The opposite. The Torah tells us that before you engage in war, try to make peace. Regretfully, with terrorism, they understand the opposite. But you know why? Because that is their DNA. Their DNA of terrorism from the Torah early days is violence. What happened with Aisab? al here. You will live to the sword. So their DNA is violence. That's why they are prone to violence. And the Jewish people are completely the opposite. The Pasuk says, When you're going to go to wage a war, try to make peace. Because in war, they are, even though there is the winning nation and the losing nation, but no one guarantees that there will not be casualties in a war. Correct? And people that get maimed and, and handicapped and wounded and widows and orphans. So the Torah promotes the concept of peace. So it says a Hafez Haim, in an army, you have different levels. You have the commander in chief, you have the general, you have the lieutenant, you have the sergeant, you have the corporal. You have the fellow who, who, who is the medic. You have the fellow that works in the office. You have the fellow who just cleans up the, 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 the camp, the, the tanks. There's a fellow who deal helicopter maintenance. In other words, it doesn't minimize their value. The opposite, it says. The only way that you can have a, a, a productive army if you have all these components. Can you imagine if you only have soldiers? 
Somebody got to run the show. And if you have no medic, who is going to take care of the wounded? And if you have no cooks, who is going to take care of the food? So every position, even though to some may not be that, uh, how do I say this, active or, 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 or rewarding, but at the end of the day, you fulfill a certain mission to give support to the soldiers in the, in the, war, in the war front, in the front. As I said yesterday, how was the Jewish army divided? A group that will wage the war, another group in the middle that will take care of all the physical peripherals, food, etc., and another group that will pray and learn Torah for the success of the guys in the front. It doesn't mean that one had more benefit than the other. They were all equal, but they were part of a team. And the Zohar Kadosh writes, and it says that also in the heavenly spheres, the Zohar Kadosh explains, there is also different groups of angels which are also scattered to the four corners of the world. And it says the Zohar Kadosh that the menorah, in a way, is, was similar to the seven weeks of the Omer. We just finished the Omer, right? For those who follow our classes daily, what did we learn during the Omer? Every day, a different sefira. And what do we do after the counting of the Omer? We read the Lamnaseya, chapter 67, in the shape of the menorah. And the question is, why? <coughs> Although I answered the question then, I'll give you a different answer. The Zohar Kadosh explains that the seven branches of the menorah, each one represents a different sefira, <coughs> a different emotional attribute of how godliness is revealed into the world. Meaning to say, one pole of the menorah, we can call it hesed, kindness, benevolence. The next one, we call it gevura, restraint, self-control, etc. And we go on week after week of the Omer. Like in the nights of Sukkot, we have the seven Ushpizin. In the weeks of the Omer, we have the seven Ushpizin for seven days. The Zohar Kadosh goes further and it says, the one of the, of the ultimate blessings that the menorah brought down to Am Israel was the concept of happiness into Am Israel. The light will bring happiness. How somber the person is when he's surrounded by darkness and how happy the person becomes when he's surrounded by light, even occasionally in America or in South America or anywhere in the world, when there is an outage, right? We have hurricanes, correct? And many, many times, what happens with a hurricane comes? No electricity, remember that? Yeah. No air conditioning, no elevator. And how is the mood of the people change when all of the above is gone? And again, many of us didn't grow up with air conditioning. I didn't have air conditioning when I was a child. The shul had air conditioning. And the day they installed air conditioning, it was a big day. But what did we have before? Fans, right? The fans in the corner, the standing fan that you plug in from room to room. That's how it was back then. Probably in America, air conditioning has a long history. I'm sure more than in South America, okay? but. We, it brought, ooh, it brought happiness. So it says, Zohar Kadosh, and it says that this was a tremendous amount of happiness and blessing with Am Israel. And that's why the Pasuk says, Behetivo et Hanerot. What's the meaning of Behetivo? Although Behetivo means to enhance the candles, but it says that when there is light, there is goodness. And that's why we say that, Ulbchol Bnei Israel, Haya Or, it says in the plague of darkness, the Egyptian nation was punished that the darkness was tangible. Darkness is not tangible. Dark, darkness is abstract and darkness can only be activated 
when there is no light. Meaning to say, if I shut the lights here and I close all the curtains of the room, I'm going to have a much darker room than the way it looks today. But it says for a Yehudi, it's never dark. Because Hashem is with the person. And even though that regretfully today we do not have the physical menorah per se, like in the time of the Beit HaMikdash, but we have the Torah. And how is the Torah called, the Pasuk says? Torah or Torah represents the light of godliness in the life of the uh, person. Beautiful message of the Zohar of today. The Musar of today, it comes from Sha'are uh, Teshuvah, the great book. I'll give you the short version because I have a Spanish class uh, later on online only. So it says as follows that when a person is going when a person goes through certain challenges in life, he should say to the heart, rather It says, the worst thing Sha'alei Teshuvah writes is that a person blames someone else for whatever is going on in their life. It says the opposite. It says, sure, that God perhaps has messengers. That's a whole different story. But it says that line number one of the Shuvah says that a person says, my deeds brought this upon me. Belachen, it says, Yashu Belashem. The person is lucky that is able to realize this. That is the first opening statement of the Shuvah. As the Pasuk writes, in Perashat Kitabo, Umtsauhu, Raot, Rabot, Besarot, oh no, Mehila, Perashat Haazino, I believe. And I will encounter throughout my life great amount of hardship and suffering. Beamar Bayomahu, and the person will say, Hallo, Alkien Elohai Bekirvi, Metsauni, Haraot, Haele. An honest statement says the Torah is, that the reason why this is affecting me is because there is no godliness in my life and therefore I became a target of problems. So what does it say? It says the Sha'aret Teshuvah, it says very simple, because a person sins and a person recognizes that, that is the opening statement of Teshuvah. But it says the second paragraph, of the Sha'are Teshuvah, that the moment that a person opens his mouth or opens his mind and he decides to turn to Hashem in a good way, the instant that a person does that, who mekabel et ha Teshuvah, God welcomes the Teshuvah of the person. As we mentioned the other day, Pitholi Petah. God says to the Jewish people, open for me like the eye of the needle. What does it mean, the eye of the needle? It says, gave me a tiny opening. So you know what Sha'aret Teshuvah says, what is the tiny opening? Realizing the need to change. If a person realizes and recognizes the need to change, that is the first baby step to recovery. And I'm sorry to use an addiction type of example, but what is the first line they tell you? The person must recognize that there is a problem. But if a person doesn't recognize there is a problem and always tries to uh, justify why this happened, why that happened, how Teshuvah will be possible in such a case. So by Ezzet Hashem, uh, will take to heart the beautiful words of the Zohar of today and especially the last few words of the great uh, Rabbeinu Yonah uh, Sha'are Teshuvah to, to continue in our beautiful relationship uh, with HaKadosh Baruch Hu. and I say the following that even even if a person occasionally has a hiccup that doesn't mean that we throw in the towel David Amelech writes in the book of Tehillim 
that a righteous falls seven times. But what's the next word that comes out of it? Vakam. He's able to get up. The fact that a person is able to get up means a person recognizes the need to change. God says, not a problem. Continue. He's a sleeper. But we don't just throw in the towel. My dear friends, we say this kelam is what to our sponsors. And to everyone, have a great day, everybody. Baruch Adonai Amen, amen.